Hi, I'm Brian Patterson. I'm the mayor of Kingston, and I'm here to tell you more about Council's strategic plan. Hello, hello. Welcome to a very special episode of Tell Me More, the podcast that knows it's good to plan ahead. Steering a ship like the city of Kingston takes a few things. You need a crew to keep the ship working. You need a captain and a navigation team. And ideally, you should know where you're going, or at least where you'd like to go. In that sailing metaphor, it would be a chart. For a municipality like the city of Kingston, it's a strategic plan. This vital document is put together every four years with the start of a new term of council. It outlines what city council wants to achieve during their term and how the city staff, your ship's crew, will work to achieve the goals of the plan. On the one hand, it's a high-level document that directs city work. On the other hand, a tangible list of actions we intend to take. It impacts everything from the construction of new rec facilities, garbage collection downtown, where new bike lanes will go, and how parks and green spaces will develop. In short, this plan will impact every Kingstonian. So it begs the questions, how does a plan like this come together? How does it work? In this episode, we're going to dive right into that, starting at the highest level and ending up somewhere in the weeds of it. To help us understand this document and this process, we turn to Mayor Bretton Patterson, joining us today in City Hall. Welcome, sir. It's great to have you back here. Thanks for making the time. Thank you. It's great to, great to be here and, uh, you know, excited for, uh, for a conversation that I think is, you know, talking about something really important for the, the vision of the city. Big time, big time. So starting off, this is a plan for Kingston's future. This term of council wraps up in 2026. So at the end of this term, what do you want the city and the community of Kingston to be? What's the vision? I mean, I think that, I think that the vision that I've always had of Kingston is as a leading city. I've always thought that we punch above our weight, but I've always felt there was the potential to do a lot more. And, you know, you look at the growth that now we're seeing just even these last few years, I feel like there's a, there's a momentum on a number of different fronts. And, you know, the challenges and the opportunities that we're seeing now in Kingston, it would have been unimaginable just even a few years ago. So I think for me, it's about establishing that leadership that we're, we're, we're not a community that is, you know, behind the times, you know, following after others, we're really setting the course. And I think we're seeing more and more cities and communities across the province, across the country, looking to what we're doing here. And I think that that's really, I think what captures for me, the vision of what I would like Kingston to be known for is, is that, that leading city. So I touched on this a bit in the intro, but I want to throw it back at you for your take. Um, What's the strategic plan and how is it going to help us become that place that you just described? How's it going to help us maintain that cutting edge? Mm -hmm. Well, it's funny. I mean, I think I think when when some people hear about a strategic plan, you might think of it it's it's something that's a it's a bunch of words. But how does it actually like translate into real action? One hundred percent. And I think for me, that's what's critical. That this this strategic plan is all action. There are more than 150 initiatives, real things that as a city we're going to be working on over the next four years, and so they're going to touch all aspects of the community. And so I, I am sure I could challenge anybody in the, at the end of four years that uh, you'll be able to point and see, okay, this happened because of this plan that the council put in place. And I think that that's the key. It's not just words. This is about taking real, real action to tackle real problems that we're seeing, but also address, you know, many of the issues that have come up. They came up in the municipal election last year. I think it's really the mandate that myself and council have now is to get to work. Of course. Yeah. You know, people want to see that tangible action. They want to see tangible results from the people that they've elected. So, um, and this is something that you're obviously familiar with. You're in your third term now. This process is not a new one for you, but there must be some changes to how it's unfolded over the years. Um, Was there anything about this planning process that was different, that was um, new compared to other years? Well, it's always a really interesting exercise when you have, you know, a mayor and council elected. It's an, it's a new group and, and, and everybody has different perspectives and different priorities in mind. I mean, this is a very diverse community. We have all kinds of different priorities and everything from, from housing to uh, parks and recreation and transit and uh, economic growth and, uh, and of course, healthcare. There's so many different pieces and, and everybody around the table brings a different lens and brings a different priority. So you're really creating a mix of 13 different priorities priorities into one overarching plan. That sounds challenging. <laughs> it, is, it is certainly, um, it's an art. That's what I would say. And I think that the, the goal is 
that at the end of the day, everyone sort of buys into an overarching plan as long as their priority is in it. And so, so there's this sort of unwritten agreement to say, I will support what matters to you if you support what matters to me. And that's, that's really, I think, what comes, that's the teamwork element of this that I think has worked well in the past. But I think what, you know, to your question about what's different this time, uh, the fact that the majority of council was new. Yeah. I mean, out of, out of 13 people around the council table, Eight of them uh, are new. They they've never served in municipal government before, and that um, that's been exciting. You know, they've they've brought really different uh, perspectives, different questions. Uh, sometimes when you're when you're on council for long enough, sometimes you're just used to seeing things a certain way, and so somebody that comes in from the outside are like, "Oh, well, why is it that we do it that way?" And sometimes you need that, right? It, yeah, it just brings that fresh outlook and fresh perspective. And so, um, so I think it's actually been, in my view, I think one of the best strategic planning processes. Interesting. That we've ever had. That's great. Um, and it, it sounds like it would be a good process, too, for a new council to kind of mesh together, get to know the personalities, since you're going to be working together for four years, right? Yeah, for sure. And I mean, and, and I really need to give credit where credit is due here. I, I think that every single person around the council table has bought into the importance of, of teamwork. That doesn't mean that we agree on every issue. And to be honest, we shouldn't. No. Because you know what? There's, there's differences in the community, and that should be reflected around the council table. There are difficult decisions we're going to have to make over the next four years. But I think what we've agreed is that by, by taking this approach, by supporting city staff on each of these initiatives, that this is how we're going to advance the community. And if we can advance it in a number of different ways, we can make sure that everybody can point to the priority that was most important to them and say, hey, we made progress. So rather than fighting each other and, and not going anywhere in four years, we've got a vision, we've got a course, we've got a roadmap, and now, uh, and now we can work together on it. Sounds great. So I, I guess it goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway. The future is pretty hard to predict. Uh, we all learned that the hard way with the onset of COVID-19, um, kind of completely upended city operations for a time. So with that in mind, how do you account for the unaccountable in the planning process? Because you're looking at a plan that stretches out four years. So if everything goes smoothly, great, we check all these off. But how does this plan guide decisions, say, if we have a time of upheaval where you need to reprioritize? Well, I mean, I'm certainly hoping that we're not going to have another global pandemic or something on that scale to deal with. But um, but you know what? It, it's true. Life is real. And, you know, we know that there are things uh, that we're going to be dealing with a year or two from now that weren't on our radar when we put this plan together. That being said, you still got to have you still got to have a vision. You still got to have a direction about where you're trying to go. And I don't think I mean, we may have to make some adjustments. We may have to pivot here and there. But I also believe that the priorities that we've set uh, matter and are the right priorities no matter what. I can't imagine anything changing um, that dramatically that would stop housing from being a priority right. or, uh, or, or um, you know, environmental stewardship and climate action. I, I can't imagine anything that would say those are no longer priorities or, or economic growth. So, so I think that we're comfortable enough with the vision. But yes, do you, do you have that flexibility to be able to shift gears? Of course. Uh, and that's why. Yeah, that's why we don't put the city on autopilot for the next four years. We're obviously <laughs> still going to be there and discussing the details. But I think it's, it's important to have a vision rather than just being reactive yes. to whatever comes our way. It's better to be proactive. And I think that that's what this plan is talking about gives you that chance to sort of reset priorities too if you need to as it as things unfold um so with a with a plan of this scope and the scale it's a little ambitious um so how does that fit in with city finances are, are we headed for large tax increases with something like this or well to your point it, it is a very ambitious plan it's it probably stretches the, the boundaries of of what we can do but um my personal view is I think it's better, if anything, you've got a plan that stretches you a little bit um, to make sure that we, you know, can, can send a message to the community. We're going to work as hard as we can over four years. That being said, one of the big pieces within that planning is to say, you know, people are, are stretched. The cost of living has been rising. We want to make sure that, um, that we're responding to that. And so uh, what we've committed as, as a council is that we would have 
property tax increases among the lowest of other comparable cities across across the province. We had that. We've had that the last couple of years. We want to continue to do that. Um, so we're looking at tax increases that would still be at or below inflation, uh, lowest than the most other cities. And and the way we can do that is by being creative, being efficient, and the growth that we're experiencing. All of those things can help bring some of the revenues to the table that we need to uh, to advance projects. But then we also need creative work. For example, myself, one of my big jobs is advocating for funding from the province, from the federal government, from other sources, because we can't we can't do all of this on the city's dime either. So a lot of this plan is about, okay, here's what we can do. We're going to bring the city resources to the table, but now we need to find partnerships. We need to find other sources of uh, whether that's that's land or dollars or people, whatever that looks like. Um, but that's the kind of big picture thinking that I think is, is needed right now. How can you leverage what you have to do more exactly. with it and, exactly. and be more creative? That makes sense. Um, so one last question on this planning for the plan theme. Um, what's Kingston's competitive advantage? And I think you've touched on bits of this a little bit coming forward, but what's our competitive advantage with similarly sized and resourced cities? And how does that factor into our planning process for this? Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I think there's a couple things that come to mind. I, I've, always, I've always felt that Kingston's size is actually a competitive advantage right now. We are big enough that we have a number of other key community players. And so, you know, I'm not looking just within City Hall. I'm looking at the community as a whole, whether it's our post-secondary institutions, our business community, our social service agencies. You know, we've got a num- we've got a whole network of people. And we're, we're big enough to have all that, but not so big that you can't bring everybody to the same table. Right. So this strategic plan, more than any other plan, is com- is geared to community. It's 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 about how do we bring in all of these other community partners? And and to be honest, that would not fly in in you know Toronto or like a large city. You can't do that. It's just the scale is too big. Right. It's too difficult to to manage. So I think that that's a huge competitive advantage for us. I mean, obviously the other pieces that come to mind is the people we have here. Mm-hmm. You know, we've got a smart and engaged community. Always bringing ideas to the table, which is great. Uh, And then the other piece is just our quality of life, right? I mean, this is one thing and people are noticing, and I think that's why Kingston is growing. The people are, people are discovering the incredible quality of life that you can have here. And when you look at remote work and you look at how the world has changed, there's more and more people that, you know, maybe they were closer to the GTA that are saying, okay, uh, I want to, I want to come and, and, and see what we can do here in Kingston. So I think that those are all competitive advantages that we can harness. Well positioned. Interesting. Okay. Well, then let's let's get out of the sort of high level stuff and dig into the details on this plan a bit. It's big, and I encourage anyone interested in seeing the plan in its entirety to check out the city's website, search for strategic plan, and read through what's there. Um, just as an overview, there are five pillars and five foundational principles. So the pillars there: support affordable housing, lead environmental stewardship and climate action, build an active and connected community, foster a caring and inclusive community community, drive inclusive economic growth. And the foundational principles that underscore those pillars are to invest in the organization's capacity, to invest in process improvement, to maintain financial sustainability, to advance indigenization, inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility in the corporation, and to continue to advance community partnerships and advocacy with other levels of government. So, with all that said, could you tell me generally what are these? What what is a pillar? How does that differ from from um, a foundational principle? And how do these lofty statements um, lead changes and improvement in municipal operations? Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. So I mean, I think that you know, if you look at the the five pillars, a pillar is like a general theme or a priority for the community. So a good example is housing. I mean, you know. Anybody will tell you right now, housing is probably the biggest challenge, not only for Kingston, but, you know, for any community in Kingston. So with underneath the pillar are all the different actions that we can take to try to address housing, because you can't solve the housing issue with one thing. So there's a whole range of different things, whether it's obviously expanding new market housing, new affordable and supportive housing, which would have like some public subsidy to it, Uh, innovative housing competition we're going to have, we're going to kind of pitch to, uh, to, to the wider community to come up with new and innovative and affordable ideas for housing. So, so those are examples of where you've got the pillar, 
But then you've got like the specific things to say, okay, so here's what we're going to do specifically over the next four years to try to, to reach that goal and to advance that priority. So you got your, your pillars or your goals and, and underneath that you've got objectives. That's how we're going to achieve that goal. Yeah, for sure. So, so I think council's initial work was to said, okay, so we all agree on the, the five priorities about housing, climate action, and environmental stewardship, you know, building an active community, fostering a caring community, inclusive economic growth. So then we have ideas. Some of the ideas are what uh, myself or other councillors uh, have, have put forward ourselves. And then our staff have come and they've really refined it and said, okay, well, this is this is what we think we could do given given our, our resources. And here's some ideas that we have. So it's a really, uh, it's kind of a collaborative uh, approach. And that's, again, how you end up with 150 <laughs> specific <laughs> actions, which is a lot of stuff it sure is. Uh, to tackle over the next four years. It's going to be a busy couple of years coming up. Um, and, and the foundational principles, what, what are those? How do they work within the plan structure? So uh, the way I would describe a foundational principle is, you know, we, we talk about 150 things that we're going to do, but these principles are going to tell us how we're going to do it. Okay. Yeah. Right. So collaboration, how are we going to do all these 150 things? Well, we're going to collaborate. We're going to collaborate around the council table. We're going to work with staff. We're going to work with community partners. We're going to have to advocate. As I said before, there's no way that we can build the amount of affordable and supportive housing that we need or uh, attract all the, the businesses that we need or uh, build all the infrastructure we need without, you know, provincial and federal funding. So then that's my job is to, to advocate for, for that stuff. Um, on the uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion front. So how do we make sure that as we're doing that, we're doing it in a way that's inclusive, that everyone can benefit from uh, from the work that we're doing. So, so, so it's not just certain pockets or certain segments of our community that are going to benefit from council's work, but it's going to be spread uh, equitably across our community. Sort of conditions to keep in mind as you're working on the pillars. These yeah, are yeah, for sure. And sometimes that's as important. Sometimes it's yeah. it's not just it's not just where you're going, but it's the journey of how you're getting there that's important. Hundred percent. Yeah, you, you got to live it. <laughs> um, so, is there a principle or a pillar that you're particularly passionate about? Well, it, I mean, I've, it's probably already come out a little bit in my comments. I mean, I, uh, it's interesting. I mean, my background, I'm an economist. And yes. so I actually ended up running for city council um, with very much a lens towards economic growth and development and attracting great, you know, quality jobs and careers uh, to, to the city. And I still have that passion. But I think that, um, you know, really over the last few years, housing has just... It's just become such a key need. And, and the way I would describe housing is we can do a lot of things right. Yeah. But if we don't get the housing piece right, if we don't make the progress we need to make on housing, it's really going to cast a shadow over everything else because it, it's tied in, right? At the end of the day, housing is one of those fundamental needs. Mm -hmm. uh, no matter you know what segment of, of the community we're talking about, it all starts with housing. Mm -hmm. You know, you can build off of that. So I think that you know, if I had to say what's the pillar that I'm most focused on, obviously it's it's all, all important and it's all integrated in advancing community. But I think housing is the one that's uh, definitely, you know, is a big focus for me. One right of now. the first dominoes. Yeah, really for sure. And it is, the first, it is the first pillar, I think, for a reason, yeah. uh, because I think it just speaks to, you know, if you ask the average person on the street, what do you think is the biggest challenge facing Kingston? I think that nine out of 10 people would say housing. So I think that we, I think we've got the pulse of the community. Uh, so I think now it's addressing that piece, but that's not to say we're not also going to work on, you know, the healthcare piece the family doctor piece. There's so many other other things that we're hearing from the community. But I think if you went to anybody in the city and, and they look through those initiatives, they would see their ideas and concerns uh, and issues expressed in this plan. Yeah. I think it's a very, very comprehensive plan. And so, you know, obviously, uh, you know, lots of work ahead. Um, so off the top, I promised our listeners that we would end up in the weeds of this plan, and I'm going to keep my word on that. <laughs> so into the weeds, we get tangible impacts that the community members will notice. So I've picked out a, two different goals under each pillar. Um, I'll read out a goal and ask you to tell me what it means and how we're going to achieve that. <laughs> if that sounds good, we'll start with uh, supporting housing affordability and the goal of ensuring growth planning strategies that support and enable the equitable dist distribution of housing types across the city. Hmm. So basically what that's speaking to is that we want, for example, affordable, supportive housing, not just to be concentrated in one pocket of the city. Mm -hmm. We want it to be integrated across the city. So what that means is, right, market housing 
being built all over and affordable housing being built all over. So, so that it's not, so that we're not creating these neighborhood effects where, you know, one neighborhood is, 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 uh, is put above another that really everyone, that's what you build community is just that integrated piece yeah. where anybody, no matter who they are, would feel comfortable in any part of the city. So that's, that's that piece. Awesome. Um, so next under that pillar, uh, invest, investing in affordable housing. Well, it comes down to just, you know, getting it done. And so we have a very ambitious goal of 480 affordable and supportive housing solutions. That is far, far higher than we have ever aimed before. It's going to be a lot of work. It's going to require a lot of advocacy on my part. Um, but we think that, you know, if we work hard that we can get this done. So that's to, that's to help hundreds of people that we know um, that are, you know, some facing very difficult situations where our community members who are vulnerable making sure that we can really advance this for them. And that's one where you would need to do the advocacy with the other orders of government to find that support, I would assume? You do, you do. Because I think, you know, we're talking about housing that ultimately does require some sort of public subsidy because housing is just too expensive too expensive. There's a number of people that just simply can't afford a housing solution on their own. Uh, so this is where we we pull together. But yeah, the city doesn't have the dollars to do this alone. Right. We're, we are going to put some dollars in though. We're going to do as much as we can, but that's uh, my job is to make sure that we can get the the federal and provincial dollars that quite frankly, Kingston needs. And so um, so that's my, that's my push. Uh, I'm going to be doing a lot of door knocking and making a lot of phone calls over the next few years. So let's move it on to climate action. Um, the next pillar is to lead environmental stewardship and climate action. And the goal is to collaborate with conservation authorities on flood mitigation measures and opportunities to restore and maintain floodplains, wetlands, and shorelines. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think on the climate front, you know, obviously there's a, there's a big push to, to reduce our, our emissions, but we also have to recognize a lot of this is mitigation, right? There, are, the climate is changing. We have to make sure we're resilient in that, and so we're in it now. So the resiliency piece for us is making sure that our shorelines are in good shape, so that we're not getting flooding. So a few years ago, we had major issues, for example, down on Abbey Don Road in the right. East End, right? So we've made major investments in there to make sure that that those roads in low lying areas, for example, are are um, uh, not going to be at risk of flooding in in the future. A number of other pieces along our beautiful waterfront. It's beautiful, right. but we need to make sure that it's in good condition as well. So there's another other portions along Cataract Way River and Lake Ontario, uh, again, being proactive to make sure that if there are weather events, extreme weather, uh, you know, high water levels, that, um, that that's not going to cause uh, excess damage. Right. Okay. Um, also under the environmental stewardship and climate action pillar, the goal of developing a biodiversity conservation strategy. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think this is very much... An example of where, as a city, we're, we're interested in leadership opportunities. So we know, for example, that uh, Montreal has a has a biodiversity pledge, and I think that so we want to have a look at that, see what we could adopt here. I think it's looking that as much as we're building housing, that we also have pockets of uh, we have green space, that we also have uh, a strategy where we can ensure, for example, endangered species. What I think about the work we've done, you know, protecting turtles yeah. and, and other pieces, making sure that we have that environmental lens. Uh, that are, you know, whether it's wetlands, whether it's uh, other other green spaces, that we can make sure that it's it's healthy, not just for uh, for humans, yeah. but it's healthy for all living things in our community. Well, Kingston's sort of uh, blessed with a lot of wetland space, a lot of marshlands um, want to protect them. So moving on to the pillar of building an active and connected community, the first goal I want to ask about is improving the frequency and connectivity of the transit network. That's a, that's a big one. <laughs> yeah, it is. Well, I mean, we're really proud of the the investments we've done in transit over the last number of years. And, you know, for a number of years, we were leading the country in transit ridership growth. And so uh, really up until the pandemic, wow. obviously the pandemic was, uh, you know, was a real curveball uh, there. But, you know, we're starting to see that come back in strength. And so how do we then build on that momentum we had? So uh, investigating, for example, uh, transit options to, to, to Westbrook, to Lemoyne Point and the Kingston Airport, 
to increased frequency uh, with to Amherst View, which is just to the west of us, but a growing community there as, as well. Uh, rural transit options. Yeah. One of the things we're saying, well, we've got a growing community that is outside of the, the urban core. And so what sort of creative ideas uh, are there for, for people to have transit options uh, outside of the, the urban area? So so lots of potential and opportunities to, to explore there. Incredible. Yeah, and I, uh, expanding transit out beyond just the urban core would also uh, create options for people that want to take climate action by you know driving less or... Yeah, for sure. And I mean, it might look different. It may not necessarily be the, the same sort of transit you see in right. the urban core, but you know that again is an example of leadership and innovation, right? right? That I think Kingston, we could... Uh, and if we can figure out something that works in Kingston, uh, other rural communities right across the province could could look at that as well. Yeah. Um, also under that pillar, uh, a goal to prioritize pedestrian connections and dedicated cycling lanes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think that, you know, this is about encouraging active transportation. And quite frankly, right now, there's areas of the city where active transportation, you know, walking or cycling or transit is convenient. Mm -hmm. And there's other areas of the city where, quite frankly, it's not as convenient. So I think we're really aiming for, you know, some of the suburban areas uh, to try to make those investments that make active transportation a convenient and appealing option for people. So we're looking at it, for example, um, you know, investments to in Bay Ridge Drive and right. Days Road. We're right? talking about like in the west end of the city, which uh, which is the area where, where, where I live and yeah. many others do as well. Um, but create sometimes it's just those connections to uh, whether it's a cycling lane, sometimes it's a pedestrian path to get you to a transit stop that just, you know, it just makes suddenly transit or active transportation more convenient. And creating them in a way that's safe for families and appealing to individuals. Yeah. yeah. Um, so turning to the theme of community well-being under the pillar of fostering a caring and inclusive community, could you tell us a bit about the goal to lead the implementation of the community safety and well-being plan? Sounds interesting. What mm. is it? Yeah, the community safety well-being plan is a, a it's a really a revolutionary plan and it's it's going to take some time to, to get this off the ground, but it really is this idea of breaking down silos and 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 bringing different community partners to to the table. So a good example is food security, okay. right? So that's because that's a that's a huge issue for 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 many people, and especially with the inflation and food costs, it's even better. So food security, you need the city. You need the food bank. You've got other great frontline agencies like Lion Hearts and St. Vincent de Paul and others that do meal programs. But you've also got the farmers, right? We've got agricultural partners in uh, in the rural area. We've got the community training farm. There's all these different elements. And the whole idea of this well-being, safety and well-being plan is bring everybody to the same table to create a plan that works for everyone. So that's an example of this, this, the, the work we'll be doing over the next few years. So it goes back to what you were talking about, about being the right size where we can bring all those partners to the same table and coordinate effectively. Exactly right. Next, under that same pillar, we have uh, a goal to advance indigenization, inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility in the community. So what does that mean to you? So, I mean, I think, again, you know, coming back to a foundational principle of what we're going to do and how we're going to do it, um, the fact is our community is growing rapidly and we're becoming, we're becoming more diverse. It's amazing how not a week goes by that I don't meet uh, a new individual, a new family that's, um, that, that's come to Kingston. Uh, some of them have, have moved from other parts of Ontario, but an, an increasing number are relatively new to Canada as well. So we're we're looking at everything from a, a, a newcomer's welcome day, outreach to international students, um, work on our on our labor force, which is key. So how do we make sure that marginalized groups, that diverse groups, uh, are are getting access to the employment opportunities that they need? So it's really about um, that that word inclusive. You know, I mean, when, when I think of that, I think of that like sense of belonging. I think of that, okay, you know, I belong to Kingston, Kingston belongs to me, that community support. Um, so, so there's all kinds of different initiatives and outreaches, but it's all about, again, creating that, that sense of, of welcoming and, and opportunities for, for housing, for employment, for uh, civic engagement, all of those things. Incredible. Um, and I, I guess that would then be something that kind of underscores a lot of the other work that the city does as a, as a goal. Yeah, 100%. Because when you look at 
you look at all the pieces we want to do on housing and recreational facilities and parks and economic growth and healthcare. We want to, again, make sure that all of these improvements that we're working on are accessible to everyone, that it's not just going to be a, a subset of people that can access it, but that ultimately these are opportunities that are available to everyone. Kingston for everyone. Um, so we're coming down to the last pillar here. Uh, we have driving e- inclusive economic growth. So starting with the pillar of consi- or, sorry, starting with the goal of considering opportunities to enhance sports tourism. It sounds kind of interesting. Yeah, sports tourism is a really interesting opportunity for us. You know, you think about the number of, of, of tournaments, you know, in Kingston's location means that, you know, there's all type of opportunities for everything from, from, from hockey to track and field to, to basketball, many other sports. But one of the, one of the things that's high on the radar is aquatics. And we are looking at, you know, ways to expand aquatic facilities, maybe even look at the feasibility of building a new aquatic center. It's ambitious. There's a lot of work to do on that piece, but it is something that has a sports tourism component, that there are all sorts of tournaments that in turn would bring uh, people to the community, that in turn brings dollars into into our hospitality and tourism industry, that supports other jobs. And so there's a ripple effect, right, from sports tourism. And so uh, that's certainly something we're going to be looking at closely. You have like a hockey tournament and you've got family that comes, stays a couple nights, spends some money at a hotel, at some restaurants, does some tourist stuff. It adds up, eh? It's millions and millions of dollars (laughs) of economic impact. Back, which in turn that means careers for people here in Kingston. So, uh, so, so ultimately, how how can we bring that investment here? Okay. Um, so the other one I have under that one is exploring opportunities to implement priority pedestrian zones. Also sounds very neat. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I think we're we're doing a lot of work. You know, and not exclusively in the downtown, different places around the community, this idea of placemaking, this idea of experience a place where you're not just driving through, but you're experiencing the sights and the sounds and the tastes. And that's 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 key, not only for tourism, that's that's essential to our quality of life as as residents. Uh, And so one of those ideas is pedestrianization. Think about the success of like the Princess Street promenade. Think about some of the things that we did during during the pandemic where we actually closed off parts of Ontario Street and restaurants were putting tables out into the uh, into the middle of the street. Now we did that because of public health concerns, yeah. but when we did it, we ex- we realized what an amazing experience this it is. It's a great idea. We should try this again. <laughs> so that actually opened up a whole new opportunity for us. And so we are looking at a you know a couple of areas, for example, in and around City Hall on Market Square, whether that's Market Street or Ontario Street. Uh, more opportunities on Princess Street, where you know it might be a might be a temporary closure over a weekend in the summer, or maybe there's there's more that we could look at. But really about creating that sense of place. Uh, that I think really helps people to capture just how incredible Kingston is. Incredible. All right. Well, that's that's a lot. (laughs) Thank you for diving into the weeds a bit with me on this. Um, Before we wrap up, though, is there anything you want to say to cap off this chat with? Any final bits of wisdom in terms of the city's plan or the future? Well, I mean, I think, you know, I think just I'm so captured by the vision of where we're going and what we can be. But that doesn't happen without so many people all working together on their part. And, you know, I'm just so proud to uh, to be part of an amazing city team of people uh, working in all different areas that are going to help make this plan a reality. And I think that in turn, again, establishes Kingston as the great city it is, but a, a leading city. So, um, so I know it's... Uh, you know, it's, it's an ambitious plan, but again, I, I have full confidence in the amazing team that I'm working with that uh, we're going to do great things. That's great. Uh, well, that seems like a great place to leave it for today. So thank you very much for taking the time to be here. Thank you to our listeners for joining us. We'll be back next month with a new episode and we'll be back in four years with a new strategic plan. Let me just say that there is a lot more to this than I could possibly ever cover in one podcast episode. If your interest is piqued, I strongly encourage you to visit cityofkingston.ca slash strategic plan, one word, and take a read through. There's a lot there, but then again, we're planning to do a lot. And as always, if you enjoyed this podcast, please consider rating us or subscribing. Ratings help us reach a wider audience, while following or subscribing means you won't miss new episodes. And if you have a topic you'd like us to tell you more about, please let us know. We're always happy to receive mail. Send us a note by emailing podcasts at cityofkingston.ca. Stay well, everyone.